Would you please open up your Bibles to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms. You want to go to Psalm 101. Psalm 101, and we'll begin reading with verse number 1. Psalm 101, verse 1. The Bible says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked, all f- wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. If you'll take note uh, in verse number 2 and in verse number 6, There's a phrase that's repeated and it says, in a perfect way, in a perfect way. That's what we've been looking at as we've been going through Psalm 101 with the idea or the, or the, uh, the theme here of in a perfect way. And uh, what we found was David is determining and purposing in his heart to do everything in his life in a godly way. And we've concluded that we should also be determining and developing these same godly ways in our lives and and, and in our service for the Lord as David did in his life. And if if I may correct myself, that we're not the actual ones developing it, but the Lord, we need to let the Lord develop it in our lives um, as he put the desires in David's heart. May we have the same desires to make some resolves and some dedications in our life as he did in Psalm 101. Let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we sure do need you. Lord, we are nothing without you. We are so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to bleed and to die and to be buried and raised from the dead to pay for all of our sins. Actually, the sins of the whole world. And Father, you allowed me to get in on that. And I'm so thankful for that Thursday night on January 27, 2000, where I realized that I needed you as my Savior and I trusted you. So thankful for that. Thankful I can call you Father tonight because you've never left me nor forsaken me. You're so faithful. You're so faithful to us. And uh, we need you, Lord. We need you to reveal some things to us tonight. We need you to give us liberty to respond to your word. And liberty, as I preach your word, uh, Lord, just help in all that's said and done. Uh, Maybe for thine honor and glory, Lord. We thank you again for your word that you have have given it to us, your inspired word, and you've preserved it. And now we're looking in it trying to find out what you want for us. And so guide us to this night. And if there's one that, that's here or that hears this message, Lord, that does not know you as their personal Savior, would something that's being said uh, bring conviction uh, through your word to their hearts that they might humble themselves and come to you and be saved. Father, we thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we looked at in verse number 1. The Bible says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. And what we looked at here was in a perfect way, David determined to sing right. We made the application and said that our hearts must be right with the Lord when singing. We must be singing about something that pleases the Lord, and we must be singing to the Lord about the Lord. Something about the Lord swelling up within us as we walk with the Lord. We have this perfect heart, and we're walking in a perfect way, causes us to sing right. And we want to do that. We want to make that resolve like David did in verse number 1. But in verse number 2, the Bible says this, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And the second thing we looked at was in a perfect way, David determined to behave right. When we come to verse 2, we, we took several Uh, lessons here to look at verse 2, and we ask some questions. How did David want to behave? He said, I'll behave myself wisely 
in a perfect way. How could David behave this way? Oh, when wilt thou come unto me, he said. That's, he's talking about the Lord's presence. And then we asked, how thorough did David want to be in his behavior? He said, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Even within his own house, in the confines of his family, he said, I want to have a perfect heart. There's no time to not walk with you, Lord. And we made the observation that we must behave right by living in the presence of the Lord and living through His power. We need to determine to have a consistent, progressive motion to our spiritual life around our family and close friends because our hearts are upright and full of integrity. We come to verse 3, and the last time we met together, we saw that in verse 3, the beginning of it, it says, "...I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes." Well, we started talking about in a perfect way, David determined to look at the right things. That's a big problem today um, because the devil sure does know that we have the lust of the eyes and he puts a lot of things in front of us in order for us to be sidetracked. And so David knew that. Even back then, there were things that, that he could look at and things that he could uh, want to have, um, whether it be uh, someone or something. But he said... I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So we talked about the side of wickedness is to be avoided. He said, I will not set it before my eyes. That means he was going to avoid it at all costs. He wasn't going to sit in front of something or set something in front of him um, that he knew the Lord didn't delight in. And so he was declaring that he didn't want to put that worthless, unprofitable, and destructive speech, action, or physical object around him so that he could not look at it or listen to it or both of those things. And so we move on from the side of wickedness is to be avoided to the second half of verse 3 here. And he says, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Well, we see the little phrase, I hate the work of them that turn aside. And we see not only that the sight of wickedness is to be avoided, but the sight of wickedness is to be hated. He said, I hate the work of them that turn aside. The phrase I hate means to extremely dislike something with the idea of an enemy. The mood of the Hebrew word here implies that it's, that it is a completed condition in David's heart. It wasn't something he was still mulling around or trying to determine. It was already completed and he was speaking to the Lord out of an already resolved heart and committed heart not to do this. There's no debate or room here in David's heart about how he feels toward wickedness. And by the way, there ought to be no room in our hearts to, to move on how we feel about wickedness. This hatred came from a perfect heart in verse 2. At the end of verse 2, he said, He wanted to walk within my, within my house with a perfect heart. And when you have a perfect heart toward the Lord, then there's good things that come out of that. Now, when he said perfect heart, he didn't mean that he had a sinless heart, that he never did what was wrong, or there was no temptation to come to him that he yielded to. Um, there in his life. But what I find when it says a perfect heart, it would mean a complete heart, a mature heart, one that didn't want to stay in a place of disobedience to God. If it found itself there by being tripped up, then he would go directly to the Lord and he would take care of that situation. He wanted to walk with a perfect heart. If he, if he was walking within his family with a perfect heart, if he offended his wife by something he said or, or if he offended his children by something that he did, then he apologized for that and he got right with God and he got right with his family or his friends or whoever it was, his, his uh, servants that were serving him. He wanted to have a perfect heart. It, it wasn't toward just one person, it was toward everybody, but most of all it was toward the Lord. And out of that perfect heart, there comes a perfect hatred for the work that those that turn aside from God and His ways do. And so the sight of wickedness is to be hated. We do not need to delight in wickedness. We do not need to gaze upon wickedness. And we don't need to endure in our life in wickedness. And by the way, if we are in wickedness, then we're enduring. Because that's not what the Lord has for us. The Holy Spirit is lusting against our flesh, trying to persuade us and woo us to do what the Lord has put in our hearts to do as His children. Now the phrase, the work, means to do, make, produce, or prepare something. And then the next phrase, the phrase uh, the, of them that turn aside means to swerve or fall away from something. So these people are turning aside from restraints and standards in their lives. 
God always puts fences up. God always tells us there's a, there's a border that we ought not to cross or, or something we ought not to be, a way we ought not to be thinking or a way our feet ought not, not to be going or something our hands not, ought not to be doing. And, uh, and so these people didn't care about it. They were turning aside from it. They didn't care about the straight path that the Lord had for them, and they turned from it. Now, these people are impatient of all restraints. They're given to unbridled passions, and they are headstrong and ungovernable in their gratification of their sinful desires. They're trampling on the holiness of God Almighty. This is what they're doing in their life. I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 2 with me. 2 Samuel chapter 2. And we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 21, the story here of Asahel and Abner. And there was just a battle to take place, and uh, Abner was on the, the winning side here of that. And, um, and Asahel was running after Abner as he took off and, and left. And verse 21 picks up there, And Abner said to him, Turn thee to thy right hand or to thy left and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me, wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? So he wound up stabbing Asahel, because he would not turn to the right, or would not turn to the left, but he just kept following him. And the point I want to get across to you is the Bible said that he hates the work of them that turn aside. The Abners of this world are always going to try to get us to turn aside. Always get us to turn to wicked. Now the thing with the, with the Abners of this world are they're actually going the wrong way. And they're going to get us to follow them. Now Abner didn't want Asahel to follow him. And he was trying to get him to turn aside. But what we can learn from Asahel is we ought to be like him. And we should follow the Lord. We should follow hard after the Lord and continue to want to be right near Him. And uh, Asahel did that all the way to death. And so we ought to follow the Lord and just keep following Him and we ought not to turn. No matter how many people in the world turn, um, we ought not to turn. See, David was voluntarily putting restraints and standards in place in his life in order to keep himself from getting, even getting close to sin. There's nothing wrong with restraints. There's nothing wrong with a standard in your life. Uh, I think when, when we think of standards uh, today, uh, a lot of Christians would say, well, you, I don't need standards. I don't, wh why, why do people have standards in their life? You're trying to put us underneath the law. But no, standards are not the law. Standards are something put in your life like a fence that keeps you going over the cliff into sin. And so if you, if you place a standard or a fence in your life and say, I don't need to go past that fence in my life, it's going to keep you from going over the edge in your life. David said, I have some of these things. One of them was he said, I'm not going to set any wicked thing before mine eyes. He has some more standards in this, in this psalm as well, but that's one of them. And it appears that he doesn't even want to be around those people that are doing it. That. That's a standard. And really, we all have standards. If you want to call them standards or not, and the people who, um, who are against anybody having standards in their life that we can live however we want to live and we can do however we want to do, they have standards in their life too. They're just the standards the world gives them. That's the, that's the end uh, of that. I mean, the, the Bible does tell us. Now, we're going to go back and look at Deuteronomy. And the Lord was speaking to Israel. And, of course, I understand the difference between the church and Israel. Um, but we all ought to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, whether it be Israel living by faith or us living by faith. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32, the Bible says, Ye shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you, ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that ye may be, it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. He said, don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. Do exactly what the Lord has for you to do. And in uh, Joshua chapter 23 and verse 6, the Bible says, Be therefore very courageous, to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. That would have been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
And he says that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Now that was their Bible. That was their Bible. The law of Moses was all that they had. And we ought to do the same with our Bible. If the Lord says it's right, then it's right. If the Lord says it's wrong, then it's wrong. We ought not to turn to the left or to the right. Now, somebody is setting our standards in our life for what we're going to look at. The world's trying to set the standard and trying to make it as low as possible because they want to feel good about it and they want everybody else to feel good about what they're feeling good about. And so if we don't let the Lord set our standards, if we don't look into the Word of God and find where the Lord stands, then we're going to let the world set our standards. They're going to set our standards in how we dress. And we have a lot of publicly undressing in America. And that's not what the Lord has for His children. Undressing. They're going, to, they're going to tell us that we can dress however we want to dress. There are no standards for that, the world's going to tell us. But they do have a standard. They do have a standard. Then they're going to give us uh, standards for our amusement. They're going to give us standards for our music. They're going to give us standards for the values that we hold in life and the, the principles by which we govern our life with. If we don't let the Lord do it, then what's going to be our standard? It's going to be just like in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, where every man did that which was right in his own eyes. His own standard. And we call that chaos, anarchy, lawlessness, because everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. And that is not of God. We ought to have a holy hate for the wicked, impure things of this world. Let's look at a few verses here, and starting in Psalm uh, 11. Psalm 11 and verse 5. The Bible says here, The Lord trieth the righteous and the wicked... And him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. The wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now the Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked, his soul hateth, the Bible says. There is a right way and there's a wrong way. And we ought to hate the wicked way. The Lord hates it, we ought to hate it. Look at Psalm 97 and verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, and everybody that's a Christian, oh, I love the Lord. The Bible says this, if that's true, hate evil. He preserveth, that's the Lord, the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Do we love the Lord? We can gauge that by if we hate wickedness. If we don't hate wickedness, then we cannot go around boasting that we love the Lord, because the Bible not only says that we'll hate wicked, there's other things in the Bible that it says that if we love the Lord, then we're going to hate some other things because that's what the Lord hates. And He'll put that in our hearts as well as we're following Him. Psalm 119, 104 says, Through thy precepts, talking about the Lord's precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, because we have understanding from God, I hate every false way. Verse uh, 128 of Psalm 119. The Bible says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things, not just some things, not just the things at the house of God, or not just the things that deal with the Bible. Everything, all things, how I act at, at my job, how I act when I'm around lost people, how I act when I'm around saved people, how I act when I'm in my family, how I act when I'm around my friends. Everything in our life is governed. How I act when I'm by myself. All things, he is, he, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. When we say that the Lord is right and His Word is right, and that's where it ends and that's our standard, then we'll hate every false way. Because every false way leads to wickedness and it leads to the works that we do when we turn aside. The turning aside of our hearts lead us right into that work and the Lord hates it. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. The fear of the Lord. So again, we can't say we love the Lord and we don't hate evil. And then we also can't say that, I, oh, I fear the Lord and not hate evil. We gauge our fear of God on the fact that do we hate evil? And do we love righteousness? Look at Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5 and verse 14. The Bible says, Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. 
And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of the host will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. He said, seek good and not evil. Hate the evil and love the good. And one of the things he, he says here that's equated with that is if we do seek good and we do love the good, then the God of hosts shall be with you. That ought to be enough for us. The Bible actually says that the Lord is our reward. We love Him, we follow Him, we ought to, and we ought to have a holy hate for wicked, impure things of this world, and the Bible's telling us that. In Luke chapter 16, you're probably thinking, when am I going to get to the New Testament, because that's the only thing that applies to Christians. No, that's not true, but most people think that. If it's not in the New Testament, we don't want it. Now, look at the New Testament in Luke chapter 16 and verse 13. The Bible says, and Jesus is speaking here, and he says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve both. You're going you're to love the one and you're going to hate the other, the Bible says. Well, we ought to love the Lord and hate wickedness. We not, ought not to love wickedness and, and hate the Lord. You'd say, I would never hate the Lord. Well, if you love wickedness, then you are hating the Lord. You're siding against Him practically in your life. Look at Romans chapter 7. Paul here is describing a battle that he's having. It's a struggle we all have as believers. But he says in verse 15, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would... That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. He's saying, I think some things are evil, some things are wicked, some things I've put a standard in my life. See the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians that we know of, he said, I have some things in my life that I know I ought not to be doing. I don't want to go there, and I don't want to be a part of that, and I'm not going to do it, but my flesh wants to do it, and sometimes I find myself doing that thing because of my flesh. It's, it's a war in my members, and this lust of my members is getting me to do these things. He said, I don't want to do. And the things that I do want to do, those are the right things. He said, I have problems, and I struggle with carrying those things out. Now, he wasn't a young believer at this point in his life. He's still struggling with the flesh. And by the way, until it's glorified one day and the Lord does that for us, then we're always going to have a flesh that we have to deal with. The lust of the eyes, the, the, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, we're going to have to deal with. That's the desire to, to be something, the desire to do something, the desire to have something in our life. And there's always going to be a compounded there by those temptations in our life from the world and our flesh beating us up daily, trying to get us to give in to those desires. So we see, he said, I hate the work of them that turn aside. So the side of wickedness is to be avoided, but the side of wickedness is to be hated. What do you hate tonight? What do you hate? Do you want to live in a perfect way? That's walking with God. Then he says, it shall not cleave to me. It shall not cleave to me. So the side of wickedness is not to be held onto. It's not to be held on to. It's to be avoided, it's to be hated, and it's not to be held on to. The word it is referring to the wickedness. It shall not cleave to me. The phrase shall not cleave means to cling or to stay with. The phrase to me is referring to David's mind, his thoughts, his actions, which proceed from his heart. We should not let wickedness cling to our hearts and fill our minds and thoughts and actions. And by the way... If it gets into our minds and we start processing wickedness as good and good as bad, then our thoughts will be on the wrong things and then they will turn into actions in our life. We have to be careful. The battle is won in our minds and in our hearts. The devil or his instruments may present a wicked object to a man's sight, but that man may choose whether he will entertain or embrace it or not or let that thing cling to him or not. There was temptations come. Jesus was tempted. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, but he didn't let those things cling to him. He was without sin, the Bible says. And the Lord does not want us to embrace and hold on to wickedness. 
that we're tempted with, but he wants us to let it go. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 and following. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The Lord will help us to pull down, to cast down, and to bring wickedness into captivity. That's what He wants in our life. And He wants to give us power to do that in our lives. He wants to help us. We must hold on to the instruction that the Lord gives us through His Word. That's how He directs us. He's going to direct us by His Holy Spirit, but His Holy Spirit can direct us if we don't know something in the Word of God, but He uses the Word of God in our life to direct us. So we, the instruction that the Lord gives us, we've got to hold on to that. In Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 13, the Bible says this, Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Now, obviously, Solomon, writing the inspired word of God here, is uh, speaking about instruction here um, that he's giving his son. But we make the application that um, we are being instructed by our Father, the Heavenly Father, and we are given God's word here, and he tells us to hold fast to the instruction that's given to us, and he gives us that in his word. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. The Bible says, Prove all things... Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We're to hold fast onto it. We're to hold on to the good things, not the bad things. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. So it says, stand fast and hold the traditions. There's some things we ought to hold on to that the Bible teaches and it's not wickedness. Look at Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Now, this is the message here given from God to the church at Pergamos. And he said something about what they're holding on to, and he warned them about this in their life. And he says in verse 14, um, But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. This is a bad thing. They're holding on to a bad doctrine. And it says, Who taught Balak to cast stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. These are bad things. Idolatry, causing your brother to stumble, committing fornication. Uh, he said, You ought to get away from this doctrine and quit holding on to it. And uh, some Christians are holding on to these things in their life, and they need to let these things go. They don't need to let them cling to them in their hearts and lives. Some of us don't care about other believers, and we'll do a lot of things in their presence that cause them to stumble, and we should not be doing that. We shouldn't be getting carried away in our life and uh, setting certain things before us that is tempting us to fornication. Or even to idolatry. Some of us have idols in our life and they're not little statues and we're not worshiping those little statues that we call gods, but there are gods in our life that we let control us. We ought to let go of those things and not hold on to them. Verse 15 says this, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He says, I hate the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Nicolaitans, and then he says this in verse 16 about both of those, repent. <laughs> he says, you need to get away from it. You need to turn away from those doctrines. You need to get away from that thinking. You need to come to, to the doctrine that I have for you, and you need to think the way I have for you to think. He said, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We're to hold on to the instruction that the Lord's given us. And we must hold on to not only the instruction, but the Lord is our master. With our master. Now, you might know him as your savior tonight. Some people don't think you can know him as your savior without letting him be your master and him being full-time be your master. But I think the Bible says that we have some choices. We can yield ourselves or not yield ourselves. And, and as savior, he's not always master. He's not always on the throne. And we've got to be careful. 
We need to hold on to Him as our Master. The Bible says back in uh, Luke 16, verse 13, that we already read, He said, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else, listen, he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, he's making the difference here between God and the, uh, the riches of this world, the things of this world. But he says that you cannot hold to the one. He says here, it shall not cleave to me, talking about the wicked. He didn't want to hold to the wicked. He wanted to hold on to the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord and the Lord to be his master. And we've got to be there in our life where the Lord is our master, not the things of this world, not our government, not what people say on YouTube or people say on our jobs or people say in our families. No, the Word of God has to be our master and we need to find our place rooted and grounded and built in the Word of God. Now we should just make up our mind that these impure things of the world do not cleave to us. And as we battle with them on a daily basis, as we battle with our flesh, we ought to just make a mental checklist that these things aren't going to cleave unto me. I know the devil's strategy, and when, when he brings a temptation that I know he's going to bring to me here, I'm not going to let that thing cleave to me. I'm actually going to try to avoid it if possible because I hate it because I love the Lord. And I'm, if it does come across and it does trip me up, I'm not going to let it hold on to me and I'm not going to take a double thought about it. Now, I give the illustration of this. Like, you go and you get a shower, you get all cleaned off, and most people aren't going to go once they shower and go run around outside bare feet. Well, uh, my kids will, and uh, then they have to get their feet cleaned back up again. Because when you go out, you're going to get dirty, whether you're running around or you're walking around out in the dirt. Now you're becoming dirty again because there's dirt everywhere out on the ground. We don't go and jump in the mud because we're avoiding it. We hate it because we usually get really dirty if we jump in the mud. And really, even my boys don't go shower and then go jump in the mud. Now there's times they go jump in the mud, but it's before they get in the shower because they know they're going to get really dirty and then they're going to have to get a shower again. And so I give you that illustration because as we spiritually walk through this dirty, wicked world, we encounter wicked things that try to cling to us in our souls and keep us away from the Lord. It happens every time. There's nowhere we can walk in the world that's not dirty. And the reason why is because we have sinful flesh. We think we can come to church and, and there's no dirtiness here at church, but because we have a sinful flesh... There's still things, there's still temptations. There's still things that we have to deal with. There's still things in our mind that we should have left at home or we should not be letting in our mind when we're in a church service. So there's nowhere we go that we're not going to get dirty because we're sinners and there's sin around us and there's temptations around us. We can't help but to get a little dirty as we walk through this world. But we better get cleaned up as soon as we can and not let that filth cling to us. And by the way, just because we're walking through the world and we get dirty and we got to get let the Lord cleanse us through His Word and wash us again and help us and we turn to Him and find victory, that doesn't mean that we go jump out into the mud hole just because, well, I'm going to get dirty anyway, so I might as well go jump in the, in the mud hole. Well, I'm gonna, when I go to Walmart, I'm going to see people that are half-dressed, so I might as well just go ahead and, and uh, look at pornography on the websites. No, don't go jump in the mud hole just because people don't know how to dress out in public. You just avoid it if possible, and you do, don't take a second look. These are things that you got to understand. We're gonna get, there's going to be dirtiness out in the world. When you go to Walmart, you're going to hear music being played over the uh, loudspeakers. Look, we might get dirty. We might get inundated with something when we're at Walmart. But you don't get in your vehicle and turn that same music on and listen to it all the way home and then go home and you blare it too and you watch MTV and you watch all those things and you're inundated with it. That's jumping in the mud puddle. That's not where we ought to be because that's going to cling to us. We ought to get away from it. We ought to stay away from it. And all of that boils down to whether something's going to cling to us or not, it boils down to a heart issue that we have and David had the right heart issue. He wanted a perfect heart. He wanted to sing right. He wanted to behave right. And he wanted to look at the right things. And he said, the side of wickedness is going to be avoided by me. The side of wickedness is going to be hated by me. 
And the side of wickedness is not going to be held on to by me. I'm going to get rid of that in my life. Now we've made mention before, and I know David wishes that he had this same perfect heart the night he walked out on his, his kingly estate there and saw Bathsheba. And, but you know what he did? He just jumped right off into that mud hole. And he didn't, he didn't turn around and go back in his house. And he set that wicked thing before his eyes. And it's not that Bathsheba was wicked, but the thought that he wanted another man's wife that wasn't his and then wound up in adultery with her and then killing her husband. And we know the story and how things went. And there was, he lost his son and then his other children. And it was just a, there was a whole bunch of things that happened in his life because of that, setting that wicked thing before his eyes. I know he wished he would have had the right heart. And it can happen to any of us because we're just flesh. But that's why the more, even the more so, we ought to be having the perfect heart and have the perfect way in our life. If we're going to look at the right things, we must avoid hate and let go of sin. Also, those false teachers and that false doctrine that comes along with it in this world that can so easily trap a believer because they use Christian language and Christian lingo, but they live for the world. You have to be really careful. The Lord's got to help us to have the resolve that David had in Psalm 101. And I'm so thankful the Lord gave us His Word here and give us this instruction. We can be victorious, but we have to be resolved what we're going to do and what we want to do in our life. There's no room for mediocre Christianity today. We need to let the Lord direct us and guide us. Father, we sure do thank You for Your Word. Thank You for David. Thank You for his heart. He didn't always have the right heart. But he, he sure did a, a lot of the times. He had the right heart toward you. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the testimony that you give about him in your word. Father, most of us would not have the same testimony if you wrote that much about our lives. But we want to be faithful to you. We want to avoid sin and wickedness. We want to hate sin and wickedness. We want to... Not let that cleave to us. Not take a second look. Not take a second thought. Not let it um, so be something that we meditate on in our life. Would you please help us, Lord? I know you will. Would you help us to yield to you that we might trust you with it to give us the victory that we need in our life? Maybe there's somebody, Lord, that's here and they don't, they don't know you as their Savior. They're, they're, they're lost in sin. Sin is before their eyes all the time because it's all our flesh knows. And they enjoy it. And their flesh does. They don't know any difference. And it's cleaving to them. And they have no way out. They're in bondage to sin. Lord, would you reveal to them that they could be made free from that bondage? They could be made spiritually alive. Your Holy Spirit could come in to take up residence and save them and forgive them of their sins. That they might have a perfect heart and a perfect way in their life instead of a sin-cursed way. And to be going in direct opposite of your will for their life. Would you help us as your children to help us to have the right heart? Please do this for us, Lord. Please give us victory that we need. We'll thank you for it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make Him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.